الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين استفاء خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه يجمعين أما بعض فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى كما ورد في آخر سورة التغاب أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاتقوا الله ما استطعتم واسمعوا وأطيعوا وأنفقوا خيرا لأنفسكم ومن يوق شح نفسه فأولئك هم المفلحون إن تقرضوا الله قرضا حسنا يضاعف لكم ويغفر لكم والله شكور حليم عالم الغيب والشهادة العزيز الحكيم صدق الله العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل اللقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ربنا ألهمنا رشدنا وأعزنا من شرور أنفسنا اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى آمين يا رب العالمين Dear brothers and sisters and sons and daughters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Although we have already devoted four hours to the study of Surah Al-Tawabun and although I myself am feeling nervous about the limitations of the time that we have at our disposal, but still I think it worthwhile to devote two hours today to the study of this Surah Al-Mubarakah, Al-Azimah, this grand and great Surah of the Qur'an. Because as I told you, this Surah gives us a summary, in nutshell, very brief, of what Iman is and what should be the fruits of Iman, results of Iman. Actually all these things have been discussed in detail in the Makki Surahs of the Qur'an very lengthy discourses about Iman because the main subject of the Makki Surahs is Iman. But you know this small summary, Iman and so many questions regarding Iman answered in a few ayat. This is the beauty and the importance of this Surah Al-Mubarakah. So I have, I have decided to devote fully the time today that we have to understand and have a deep understanding as far as we can of this Surah Al-Mubarakah. Just to recall, we have seen that this Surah consists of 18 ayat, 10 ayat in the first section of Ruku, 8 ayat in the second section of Ruku. Out of the 10 of the first Ruku, seven ayat are devoted to a narration of Iman, Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes in four ayat. And a very basic and universal mistake about the messengers of Allah and the prophets of Allah discussed in two ayat. And then the Iman bil akhirah, resurrection and the hereafter in one ayat. And then in the three ayat, remaining ayat of the first ruku or section, there is a very strong and forceful invitation to believe. فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَالنُّورِ الَّذِي أَنزَلْنَا وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ خَبِيرٌ يَوْمَ يَجْمَعُكُمْ لِيَوْمِ الْجَمْعِ ذَلِكَ يَوْمُ التَّغَابٌ This is a very forceful invitation and call for Iman. Now in the second ruku, first five ayat give us the five fruits of Iman. What does it mean? The changes that should occur in the feelings of a person, in his thinking, in his angle of view, in his value structure, 
in his behavior, practical attitude, what changes should happen and occur if a person has real Iman, if real living Iman to the level of conviction has entered his heart, what would be the changes brought about in his feelings, in his attitude, in his behavior, in his value structure, five ayat which we have studied. And again here, just as in the first ruku or section, now there is a very forceful call for action. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ وَاسْمَعُوا وَاطِعُوا وَأَنْفِقُوا خَيْرًا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ وَمَنْ يُوْكَ شُحَّ نَفْسَهِ فَأُولَائِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ إِلَىٰ آخِرِ السُّورَةِ Now actually today we have to focus our attention to this call for action, this forceful invitation to act. But before, you know, we go to this part, I want to make two points. One is about a very important article of Iman, which we don't find in the Quran, in these words, specified words, but which is described in the Hadith of the Prophet as a necess necessary article of faith, article of Iman, and that is Iman bil Qadr. We find, you know, if you remember Al-Imanul Mufassal, if it was taught to you in the early childhood, at least I was lucky enough to memorize these things first of all. Before my schooling began, I learned to read Quran and memorize, you know, these kalimat and then, you know, Iman Mufassal, Iman Mujmal. In Iman Mujmal, we have the mention of only one Iman, and that is Allah. Iman Billah, Tawheed. Aamantu Billahi kama huwa bi asmaihi wa sifatihi wa qabiltu jamiya ahkamihi iqrarun bil lisani wa tasdeequn bil qalb. No mention of resurrection, no mention of akhirah, no mention of prophethood, no mention of angels, no mention of books, nothing of this sort. In brief, essentially, Iman means Iman Billah. Because actually, what is Iman bil Risala? It's the extension of the attribute of Allah that He is Hadi, Hidayah, He is the guide. And you know, the culmination of this attribute of His is in the form of Wahi that is brought about, that was brought to the messengers of Allah by Jibreel, the angel. So, all these things actually, they are corollaries of the attributes of Allah. Then the attribute of Allah, that He rewards. He gives you good reward for your good deeds. And punish, He will punish you for your bad deeds. So this is Iman bil Akhirah, resurrection, and hereafter, and Jahannam, and Jannah. Ah, what are these? Actually, the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is Adil, Al Adl. So it is actually an extension of the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in Iman Mufassal we find Amantu Billahi wa Malaikatihi wa Kutubihi wa Rusulihi wal Yawmil Akhirih wal Qadr Khairihi wa Sharrihi min Allah Ta'ala wal Ba'se Ba'd al Ba'd. And it has been actually enunciated by the Prophet himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the most famous hadith which is called Hadith of Jibreel and the Muhaddisin, the experts in the knowledge of the ahadith of the Prophet وسلم, say that this hadith of Jibreel has the same position and importance in the collection of ahadith which Surah Al-Fatiha has in the Quran. Surah Al-Fatiha, Ummul Quran, Asas al Quran, in the same way this hadith of Jibreel has been termed as Ummul Sunnah. It's the basis of the whole Sunnah of the Prophet. And in that, you know, when Hazrat Jibreel والسلام, asked a question, Tell me something, what is Iman? Antu mina billahi. The, quest, the reply was, Antu mina billahi. Wa malaikatihi, wa kutubihi, wa rusulihi, wal qadri khairihi, wa sharrihi. So actually, this Iman bil aqdar, or Iman bil qadr, this is an integral part of Iman, or the article of faith. What is it? Actually, what we call Iman bil qadr, is the logical result of Iman in two basic and fundamental attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
نمبر ون قدر ہوا الا کل شائن قدیر از اونلی پوٹینٹ ہی کین ڈو ایوری تھنگ اینڈ یو نو دیر آر ایکسٹینشن آف دس ویری ایٹریبیوٹ آف اللہ سبحانہ و تعالی از العزیز ہی از آل اتھارٹی ٹوٹل اتھارٹی از ان از ہینڈس ہی از الجبار القہار ہی از کنٹرولنگ ایوری تھنگ total universe is under his control and that is what we saw in ayah number 11 of this surah al-mubarakah ma asaba min musibatin illa bi iznillah nothing can happen in this universe without the permission of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know we are in the habit of thinking that this world is going by itself even if we believe in allah we think that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the world and then he framed a set of laws of physical and chemical change these physical laws he framed them but now you know this universe is going on going on it's working automatically according to those laws as if you know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has nothing to do from moment to moment but the iman tells us no although the laws were framed by him but at every moment anything which happens is with his express permission without his permission not a, even a leaf of a tree can move this is that we must believe and we must understand that is why we can't do anything unless allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees it to be done he permits it to be done we can't do anything So this is the attribute of Allah, who Allah kulli shayin qadir, omnipotent. And the second attribute we find in this surah, At-Taghabun, it has been expressed many times, repeatedly. Wallahu bima ta'amaluna basir, wallahu bima ta'amaluna khabir. And this surah will end again, alimul ghayb wa shahada. And then you know, We have ayah number four. Ya lamu ma fi samawati wa lar. Wa ya lamu ma tu sirruna wa ma tu alinun. Wallahu alimun bil zati sudur. This is the second most important and fundamental attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His knowledge. He knows everything. Huwa bi kulli shayin alim. Ma asaba min musibatin fi lardi wa la fi anfusikum. ما اصاب من مصيبه الا باذن الله ومن يؤمن بالله يهدي قلبه والله بكل شيء عليم in this one surah having only 18 ayat at least five times you know emphasis on the attribute of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he knows everything this has been repeatedly given why now what does it mean he knows what happened in the past He knows what is happening today. And he already knows what is going to happen in the future. Rather we should say, regarding this attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no distinction between past, present and future. It's pure duration with him. He knew everything from the very beginning. He always knew what was going to happen. His knowledge is all, you know, it concerns everything. So actually this is the second attribute. And now what's the inevitable logical sequence result? Pure knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is going to happen? He knows it beforehand. And this has led to people, led people to think, because he knows everything beforehand, It means it is predestined to happen. And this is the jabr. There has been discussion in the ilm kalam of Islam. And you know this scholastic discussions of the Jews, scholastic discussions of the Christians, scholastic discussions of Muslims. This masalat wa jabr wa qadr. Whether man has any free choice or not. Whether he is predestined. This has been a dialogue, a very lengthy dialogue. But what's the life that we get from the Qur'an? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given man a free choice. 
There are so many ayat in the Quran. Man has a free choice. Imma shakiram wa imma kafura. He has the authority. If he likes to be shakir, to be grateful to us, okay, he can do it. If he wants to be kafir, ungrateful to us, or doesn't want to believe in us, okay, he has the authority. We have given him this choice. Faman shaf al yomin imma shakiram wa imma kafura it appears in Surah Al-Dhar. And faman shaf al yomin waman shaf al yakfur. Whosoever likes, he may believe. Whosoever likes and chooses, he may commit kufr. He is free. And that is why reward. If there was predestination, there shouldn't be any reward then. If you are predestined to be good, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made you good, then what, what for any reward for you? It becomes absolutely superfluous. In this same way, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forced you to be bad, he has forced you to choose, to choose evil, then why you should be punished? There's no question of any good reward or, or punishment if there's no free choice. Free choice has been given to man. But you know, Allah knows what will you do. These two things should be absolutely separately conceived. Pre-knowledge is something else. Predestination is something else. Pre-knowledge doesn't necessarily mean predestination. This is the point we should be brought home. And let me give you a very simple example. A child is playing before you. You throw a toy before him. And you know it, that he will turn towards it. But is he doing because we have forced him to do it? You knew, knew you could assess, you could guess. That when I throw this ball before this child, he will turn to it, he will try to have it. You know it, but you have not forced that child to turn to that toy or ball or something else. He is doing it out of his own free will, free choice. You have not forced him, but only you could guess that he would do it. Our guess can be wrong. Maybe at that time the child ha is, has some other, you know, preoccupation in his mind. He doesn't pay any attention towards that ball. Maybe my guess comes to be wrong. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge cannot be wrong. He knows it. But it doesn't mean that he has forced you to do it. You have the free choice. But you know Allah knows what you will choose. Allah knows it beforehand that you will choose kufr. Allah knows it beforehand that a certain person will choose iman. But he has not forced him to choose kufr, nor he has forced him to choose iman. So this is actually only what iman will cover tells us is, whatever good or bad is coming to me, it could not have come to me without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all. Wal qadri khairihi wa sharrihi. What does it mean? If something has happened to me or occurred to me which is pleasant to me, it has come to me with the permission of Allah. If something injurious, something unpleasant, something painful, if it has happened to me, it also could not happen without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because final authority is His. He is Al-Jabbar, He is Al-Qahar, He is Al-Aziz, He is all-powerful, He is omnipotent, He is controlling this universe. Nothing in this universe is out of His control. Whatsoever is happening, is happening with His permission. This is actually your belief and faith in two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is ala kulli shayin qadeer and he is bikulli shayin alim. If you have the, the deep belief in these two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the outcome is iman bil aqdar. Whatever bad or good is coming to you it is coming with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same way you try to do something you have all the means available at your disposal, still you won't be able to do it unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees it to be done. If he permits, only then you'll be able to do it. So this is actually what is meant by Iman bil Qadr. And this is the logical result of faith and belief in these two fundamental attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he is all powerful, omnipotent. And he's no, he knows everything, he's omniscient. 
Now, another point which I want to make before I proceed with the, the last three ayat. You know, in the ayah number 16, we find, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةً وَاللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ أَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ I think this is ayah number 15. Yes, 15. Verily, your children, as well as your wealth or money, they are fitna for you. And I explained last evening, fitna with which you are being tried, being tested. What will you do with this money or wealth? Just, you know, for example, again, to keep a child in mind, you give him a ten dollar bill and now see what he does. Whether he goes to a bookshop to buy a good book or he runs to a candy shop and he spends money in some sweets only or he goes to a shop of the toys and gets some toys. You can understand what is his temperament. What is his attitude? What are his priorities? With only a ten dollar bill, ten dollar note, now you have tested what is his inclination. Which way will he go? In the same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you wealth. And he wants to see what you do with it. You spend it in candies, that is luxuries. Luxuries are candies. Candies in the childhood, childhood and luxuries. When you are adults, what's the difference? Basically the same. The same sensual gratification, nothing else. Or you spend it for the cause of Allah. Or you give it, most of it in charity for the poor. What do you do with it? Actually Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you with whatever he has given you. He has given you sons and daughters. And he is seeing what you are trying to make of them? Which way do you like them to go? You are concerned only about their disworldly welfare. You are not, about, not at all thoughtful about what fate will they have in the other world, in the hereafter. Now it has proved that you have no faith, no belief in the life hereafter. So actually, whatever is your attitude with your sons and daughters and your children, actually you are being tested. What do you make them? What do you want to make them? You want them, for example, you want your son to be a doctor. You want your son to be an engineer. You want that he should have some respectable living. But you never thought that they should learn Arabic. They should understand the word of Allah. They should gain the knowledge of Islam. They should be well versed with the, with the wisdom of Islam and Quran. So that they can convey the message of Allah, convey the message of Quran, can preach the word of Allah to others. You are not doing it. What does it mean? It has proved that all your thinking is for this world only, not for the hereafter. So actually, man is being tested every moment. Whatever Allah has given him, he is being tested. Everything is fitna for him. Innama amwalukum wa auladukum fitna. Then, now what is the result? You should invest whatever Allah has given you for the hereafter. Your money, your wealth, invest it for the hereafter. In the same way, your children are also an asset with you. You invest them for akhirah, for deen. If you do it, they will become an asset for you even in the hereafter. You know, as sadaqatul jariyah, the charity which continues even after the death of a person. If you have left behind you sons, who are servants of Allah, servants of his deen, who are preaching his message 
to the others. You know, charity, your own charity, because you have brought up your son in that way. So actually, this is sadaqah jariya for you. Your charity is continuing. And you will have the reward of whatever they will be doing. They will get the reward. And side by side, your reward, you know, it will also be added, credited to your account continuously. So this is actually that you should do. We want to invest and we want, you know, our money, save it so that maybe when I'm old, this money can support me. You are investing in your sons, especially the sons, you know, because although here, you know, the word is aulad, and aulad covers both sons and daughters. But in Surah Al-Kahf we find, innama al wal banoon azinatul hayat dunya and here the word is banoon. Wealth and sons are actually zina. They are the beauty of this world, this worldly life. Now you hope that if you have money, you have some bank balance, so you can be contented that you will have something to support you in your old age. In the same way, you hope that your sons will support you. That is why, you know, this aulad was added in the previous ayat also. Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu innama inna min azwajikum wa auladikum adu wallakum. There aulad was bracketed with azwaj. Here aulad has been bracketed again with mal. Innama amwalakum wa auladikum fitna. Because aulad has two aspects. You love your children and number two, you have some hope for the future that they will support you in your old age. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants that you should have hope only from Him, not from anything else. And if you are investing yourself in your sons and daughters, in your aulad, actually the reward of your, of your investment, of your work and hard labor, only Allah can reward you fully. Nobody can give you the reward befitting of your labor. That is why this ayah ends. Wallahu indahu ajrun azim. The same wording clearly came in the end of the lesson of Surah Al Imran. Wallahu indahu husnu sawab. The good reward is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't settle for less. You invest yourself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only yourself, your money and your sons and daughters also. Invest them for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you will get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And nobody can give you better reward than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu indahu ajrun azim. Wallahu indahu husnul sabab. So actually the same thing repeated here also. And let me quote here in the end. And a, a, a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because I am using this word investment. And this is actually based on a hadith. The Prophet said, Kullu nafsin yaghdu. Every human being, when he wakes up in the morning, till night, till the time he again goes to the bed, he is investing himself, he is selling himself. He is selling his time. He is selling his expertise. He is selling his energy. He is selling his, you know, intelligence, understanding. All these things he is selling. For what? To get money. He is selling himself. That is why I use the word invest. We are investing ourselves. We are invest investing our time. We are investing our energies, our capabilities. All that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. But the only difference is, either you are selling yourself to Allah, or you are selling yourself to this world. This shows whether you have real belief in Allah and hereafter or you actually believe in this world only. Only you profess that you believe in Allah and you believe in the hereafter. Kullu nafsi yagdu fa ba'iun nafsahu fa mote koha wa muve koha. The last part of this hadith, you know, it's very meaningful. Fa mote koha wa muve koha. You sold yourself the whole day. 
but but because you took to haram means when you return in the evening to your home you have brought with you a big bundle of allah's punishment and azab also you sold yourself you worked hard but what what you what you brought home because you adopted haram means you have brought with you when you have returned home a very big chunk of allah's azab but if you restricted yourself to halal means from mote kuha you have come here come home back after selling yourself but you know you have freed yourself from the punishment of the hell or the punishment of the hereafter but i quoted this hadith only for the word bay'un nafsahu everybody is selling himself investing himself why settle for less why accept little price when allah can give you a better price he also is bidding for you in allah hashtara min al mu'minin anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al jannah verily allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already purchased from the mu'minin from the mu'mins from the believers their lives as well as their belongings in return for jannah jannah is the price that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you why settle for less may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the courage to settle you know for the maximum for the best price to sell ourselves and invest ourselves in the most profitable business and investment now come to the call for invite or an invitation for action in this aya number 16 we find four imperatives four commands from allah subhanahu wa taala and it begins with the letter fa i told you so so fattaqullaha mastata'tum number 1 have regard for allah as much as you can number 2 wasma'u and listen number 3 wati'u and obey and number 4 wa'anfiqu khairan li anfusikum and spend invest whatever you have this is good for you four things now take one by one what is taqwa i told you mostly it is translated as fear of god fattaqullah ha fear of allah least that can be said is that this is not a good translation taqwa actually is a very profound word for fear we have khauf taqwa means to save yourself as you know the most famous prayer which everybody every one of us remembers by heart waqina azab an-nar waqina save us from the punishment of fire waqa yaqi means to save ittaqa it is ittaqa actually to save yourself saving yourself and actually when you know i found the translations in english i was very glad some of the new translators they translated have regard for allah some others have translated for example allama muhammad asad remain conscious of allah you can use the words always be mindful of allah keep allah in your mind have allah in your mind have him in your heart keep his memory have him at your conscious level if you have him actually what does it mean the result of iman is taqwa if iman is there your behavior your attitude you will be looking through iman you will be hearing through iman you will be feeling through iman 
Your value structure will be changed according to the Iman. You'll be acting through Iman. Actually, when Iman permeates the whole personality of a person, the resultant attitude of a person is a taqwa. Now, there's a very profound ayah of Surah Al-Ma'idah. This is ayah number 93. You know, when final commandment came, that khamr, sharab is haram, liquor is haram, wine is haram. So, many Muslims were very much concerned. They have been drinking it all their life. It must have become an integral part of every cell of our body, so to say. It is najis. It is haram. Now our bodies, this much might have become an integral part. So they were very much concerned. Then this ayah was revealed to give them satisfaction to reassure them. Just there was concern, as I told you in the second lesson, when there was a change of Tibla, direction of Tibla. So the Sahaba were very much concerned. What about our prayers of 16 months? If that was the wrong direction, well, we have lost our, our, our prayers of 16 months. Maybe we can, you know, compensate anyhow. But those who have died, it means their iman has went in vain. What will happen to them? Because you know, salah is the first and the foremost thing in our deen. If they have lost their prayers, where do they stand? So then they were reassured, ma kaan Allahu li yuzi imanakum. No, no. Well, that was the commandment from the, the Prophet. You prayed facing towards the north. Well, your prayers were accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't be concerned. Now the commandment is, haram. Now you pray facing towards the south, towards Makkah. Now this is valid. So actually, you have to obey Allah and His Messenger. That's all. It's not the matter of direction. Lillahil Mashriq wal Maghrib. East and West and North and South all belong to Allah. Actually, it's the order of the Sharia that you have to obey and follow. In the same way, when you know liquor was declared haram, finally, there was concern among the Muslims. And to, you know, allay their concern, and to reassure them this ayah was revealed, Summat taqawwa amanu, summat taqawwa ahsanu, wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen, sadaqallahu al-azim. A very profound ayah, and I am actually quoting this ayah of Hai, to prove that taqwa is the resultant attitude of iman, and number two, it's the moving force for a Muslim. Proceed forward. You know, Islam and iman have also levels. Why stay at the lower level? Go ahead. Because in this world, everybody is, at all the times, he is endeavoring to raise his level of uh, status and his level of living, standard of living. He is trying to, from better to better, from good to better and then to best. Why not so in being also? Go forward. Be a better Muslim and Mormon. Go still ahead. Be a muhsin, ihsan. So there are three stages of religious, you know, activity. Islam, number one. Iman, number two. Ihsan, number three. And these have been given in that hadith, famous hadith of Jibreel, alayhi salatu wa salam. Akhbirni alil Islam, akhbirni alil Iman, akhbirni alil Ihsan. And now what takes one from Islam to Iman is Taqwa. The moving spirit and the driving force which will force you to go ahead, proceed ahead. Not be contented to be only a Muslim, be a real Mu'min. 
Don't be contented to be a real mu'min only. Be a muhsin. Reach the highest level. And here you find in this ayah, لَيْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جُنَاهٌ فِي مَا تَمِعُوا Time. Whatever they have drunk or whatever they have eaten before, you know, those things were declared as haram. There's, you know, nothing for, against them. If they have taken, they have been taking those things before they were declared haram. So long as they had the taqwa, and due to this taqwa, they had the iman and that they did good deeds. Summat taqwa, then they had more taqwa, and they had real iman, conviction. Summat taqwa, then again they had more taqwa, and they reached the level of ihsan. Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. And this level, whosoever reaches this level of ihsan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves him. He becomes the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he, he, he attains to this level of ihsan. It's very sad, you know, because one word of tasawwuf, it has hidden behind it the real term of Quran and Islam and Hadith and that is ihsan. We don't know this word. We know Islam, we know Iman. Ihsan we don't know. By the word Ihsan we mean to do something good to someone else. This is also one of the meanings of this word. But Ihsan is a status, a level. A level, the foremost level, Islam. When a person utters the word Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah he becomes a Muslim. He has not even prayed for once. He will keep fast if the month of Ramadan comes in his life. But he has become immediately a Muslim. As if there was a line drawn, he was on the other side of the line and no sooner than he uttered the words Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, he has come to this side of the line. He is a Muslim. Now you attain to real Iman. That is something else. قَالَتِ الْعَرَابُ آمَنَّا قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ These Bedouins are claiming that they have come to believe. Tell them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you have not at all come to believe. You can say, you may say you have become Muslims, but the real Iman has not as yet entered your hearts. So from Islam you proceed to Iman. From Iman you proceed to Ihsan, that is the highest level. When this Iman reaches the level, according to the wordings of the Prophet this conviction reaches the level as if you are seeing Allah with your own eyes. Or if you are not seeing Allah with your own eyes, you must keep in mind that Allah is seeing me all the time. I am in His presence every moment. If this is your condition, then you have reached the level of Ihsan. Now from Islam to Iman, from Iman to Ihsan, which is the driving force, which is the motivation, which is the moving spirit, it is called Taqwa. لَيْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جُنَاهٌ فِي مَا تَعِمُوا إِذَا مَتَّقَوْا وَآمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ سُمَّ التَّقَوْا وَآمَنُوا سُمَّ التَّقَوْا وَأَحْسَنُوا وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ May Allah Make us all from Muhsineen. Now, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ In one place in the Quran, this is ayah number 102 of Surah Al Imran. There Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked the Mormons, Muslims, to have taqwa as much as is due. As much as is the right of Allah. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqatih. You must, must fulfill the haqq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must be as much muttaqi as is the due of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you should be muttaqi towards him. As much as is his right, you have to fulfill it. The sahaba, the companions, they were very much perturbed and concerned. They went to the Prophet ﷺ. Who can have that much of taqwa, which is the real right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
is it within our power to have that level of taqwa? They were concerned. But when this ayah was revealed, Fattakullaha mastata'atum. Now they sighed, they heaved a sigh of relief, yes. As much as you can, as much as is the right of Allah, it's absolutely impossible for any human being to fulfill it. Because the Prophet himself has been reported to have said, مَا عَبَدْنَاكَ حَقَّ عِبَادَتِكَ وَمَا عَرَفْنَاكَ حَقَّ مَعْرِفَتِكَ Oh Allah, we have not been able to recognize you, to have your knowledge, have your marfa, as much as is the right of that marfa of knowledge. We couldn't do ibadah towards you. مَا عَبَدْنَاكَ حَقَّ عِبَادَتِكَ As much as this is your right of ibadah. We have not been able to fulfill your right of ibadah and as well as marfa, gnosis. So actually if the Prophet himself is saying it, who else can claim or hope that he can fulfill the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding ibadah, regarding taqwa, regarding marfa. But one can do as much as he can do. So actually here, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ This was, you know, for them something reassuring and on which they heaved a sigh of relief. Yes, we can do as much as we can do, we shall strive to do it. So have taqwa as much as you can. This is number one. Number two, وَاسْمَعُوا وَأَطِيعُوا Although the imperatives the orders, the commands, they are two. But I am taking them to be one. Integral part. Just as I said, you know, two sides of a picture. Sama, ta'a. Listen, obey. By listening, you know what Allah is demanding of you. Then obey it. So actually it becomes one organic whole. Listen and obey. What's the meaning? And this is a term of the Quran. Although these are the words of Arabic language, every term of the Qur'an is derived from some root of Arabic language. Iman from Amun, but Iman has a connotation of its own. Islam from Salam, ah, Salam, but Islam means as a term, it has its own connotation. So actually, although all the words, all the terms, as you have, this is the case with all the sciences. The basic terminology of physics, the basic terminology of, of chemistry. The words are derived from the English language or the language in which it is being taught. But there are definite meanings added to those words and then they become a term. So here it is fasma'u wa It's not only words and imperatives. It's a term. That is why we find it four times in the Quran. If you want to note, Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 285. Amana al-Rasool bima unzila ilayhi min rabbihi wal mu'minun kullun amana billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulih la nufarriqu bayna ahadim min rusulih wa qalu sami'na wa ta'na gufranak rabbana wa ilayka al-masir. Then you have it in Surah Al-Nisa, Ayah number 46. Then you have it in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ayat number 7. Is kultum sami'na wa ta'na. Now remember when you said, we have listened and we have accepted and obeyed. Surah Taslim Kham, the surrender of ourselves. Then again, Surah Al Nur, Ayah 51. Sami'na wa ta'na. Now this samata, this is one term. And actually, it denotes to the army discipline. The proverbial discipline of the army. What is it? Listen and obey. No questioning. No arguments. If you know in an army, a subordinate, when he has been given some command, he demands from his superior, please let me know what's the wisdom behind this, ar this order of yours. Why are you giving this, this command to me? That is not an army. This can happen in some social organization. 
This can happen in some civil association. Not in an army. Listen and obey. And there's a very famous, you know, poem of English language which I read in my high school days. I hope most of you must have read it. Charge of the Light Brigade. The command was given. Charge the Light Brigade. And every soldier included in that brigade knew someone had blundered. A very wrong decision, wrong commandment. Why? Cannons to right of them, cannons to left of them, cannons in front of them. Volleyed and thundered. They were given the order to charge. They knew. The enemies have their cannons on the right side also. They have their cannons the guns on the left side also. They have their cannons in front also. And all these cannons, you know, they are thundering, bombing, they are shelling. And in this rain of shells, somebody has decided and given us the command, charge the light brigade. Someone has blundered. But there's not to reason why. There's but to do and die. So into the valley of death rode the 600. They have to go. It's the command. You can't question the wisdom or otherwise of the command. You can't say, first, tell us what's the wisdom. Why you have given this command? Argue. No. This army discipline, listen and obey. This is samrata in the terminology of the Quran. Now, this samuta, fasma'u wa'atiyun. This is the in essential and inevitable result of Iman. You believe in Allah? Now listen to His commands and obey. No arguments. You believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? That He is the messenger of Allah? Listen and obey. No arguments. Let me quote the ayah, Surah Al-Ahzab, ayah number 36. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ It's not the case with any mu'min or mu'minah, male or female, anybody having iman. It's not worthy of them. That when Allah and Rasul, Allah and his, his Messenger have decided something, even then they think that they have some option. Options finished. Till such time that the commandment had not come, options were open. When Allah has decided something, or his Messenger has decided something, no option now. Ma kana li mu'minin wa la mu'minatin. إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ خِيَرَ اِخْتِيَار From this word is اِخْتِيَار You have no اِخْتِيَار You have no choice You have no options The inevitable result is of Iman is that when a command is coming from Allah and His Messenger you have no option except to obey وَمَنْ يَعْسِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا And whosoever disobeys Allah and his messenger, then he had gone astray very clearly, evidently, he has gone away. And let me quote the hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. لَا يُؤْمِنُ أَحَدُكُمْ حَتَّى يَكُونَ حَوَاهُ تَبْعًا لِمَا جَيْتُ بِهِ None of you can be a mu'min. Maybe he's a Muslim. He can say, I'm a Muslim. But none of you can be a mu'min, real mu'min. Unless his desires, his wishes, become subordinate to what I have brought. I have, you know, desires in me, my wishes, my lusts, bodily lusts, sensual desires, my animal instincts, they are there. 
but unless I have subdued them, I have subjugated them to what the Prophet had brought, I am not a Mu'min. You may call yourself a Muslim, but you are not a Mu'min. La yu'minu ahadukum. Clear. Statement is absolutely clear. La yu'minu ahadukum. Hatta yakuna hawaho. His desire, his wishes, all things. Taban, they become subordinate to lima jaitubi. What I have brought, the sharia, the book, the law, unless your desires, your wishes, they are subordinated before this sharia, you are not a moving. This is another hadith. La yumanu bil Quran man istahalla maharimahu. Whosoever has made something which Quran declares to be haram, permissible for himself, man istahalla. He thinks it is haram for me. What Quran has declared to be haram, he has no faith in the Quran. Ma amana bil Quran, man istahalla maharima. If you believe in Quran, that is the word of Allah, and Quran is declaring something to be haram, forbidden, not permissible, and you are using it, you are employing it, then you have no faith in Quran. This is the fatwa of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, not mine fatwa. Don't say that I'm saying it. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it. Ma amana bil Quran man istahalla maharima. Let me give another quotation from the Quran. When you know Hajj was declared to be farz, the ayah was, "Walillahi ala nas hijjul bayt man istata ilahe sabila, wa man kafara." Find the law, Ghani Yun Hamid, Ghani Yun Alil Alamin. What does it mean? When Hajj has been declared to be obligatory, whosoever can perform, he has the means. He can afford this journey. He has something to leave for his dependents for the time of his absence also. Man is tata ilahe sabila. For him, it is farz. And even if being able, after being able to do it, and he's not doing it, the word used by Quran is kafara. Waman kafara. It's a sort of kufr that he is doing, because Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has made it farz. So, ita, because we had the ayah, atiyu Allah wa atiyu Rasul. Find the one to find the Maala Rasul and Malahul Mubin. This was ayah number 12 of this very surah. But now for that ita, the, the term added is Fasmaruwa Kiru. Listen a little bit. It should be spontaneous, instantaneous, without any argument. You have to obey. Now, for whom is this samota? This is very important, and we must understand it fully. The first point that I think I have time to make is: essentially, basically, all obedience is for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and for none else. You might wonder. I am not adding the word messenger of Allah here. Essentially, basically. All obedience is to Allah, but then practically, all obedience is to His messenger. How do you know what Allah wants of you? Because He is the agent, He is the medium. But He has come to Him. He is the representative of Allah on earth. Therefore, essentially, basically, philosophically. All obedience is to Allah, but practically all obedience is to the messenger of Allah. That is why Allah says, "Wamay yutay, wamay yutay, Rasoola fakat ata Allah." Whosoever is obeying the messenger, he is obeying Allah, not messenger. 
because he is acting as the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the medium through whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has conveyed his sharia, his laws, his commandments to the humanity at large.